So you'll see a pop-up now probably saying that we are now recording. So I want to welcome everyone to our webinar tonight. My name is Jamie Vibach and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. I am also the one who has been doing our webinar series, our standard Monday, Thursday, 1 p.m. webinar series for the last couple of weeks ever since the stay-at-home order. And it's been pretty wonderful. I love doing these webinars. They are so much fun. And it's been so great getting a chance to interact with all of you, the emails I get afterwards. So I do appreciate those, um, those kind words from those of you who are joining us. So, uh, so thank you. Tonight's webinar is actually brought to you by the Village of Downers Grove. And um, so just a little bit of housekeeping up here because this is a webinar format. If you're new to this, everyone is muted, your cameras are off. So if you are joining us in your pajamas with a glass of wine, I'm jealous, um, but it's okay, we can't see you. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this webinar is recorded. So we will be posting it on our YouTube channel um, in case something happens, you miss part of it, whatever. Um, it will be recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again later. If you have any questions, please use that Q&A box down there. I know different uh, webinar folks like different uh, venues for questions. I personally prefer that Q&A box. I just feel like it helps to keep the questions a little more organized and helps make sure that we can see them as we go and they don't get lost in the chat. We will make sure to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So, and for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting, please don't click any links other than what I may post. On the Conservation Foundation side of things, these webinars, we offer them to the public for free, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending the webinars, the more it costs us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you will be taken to a page that has a bunch of resources and things you might be interested in. It also includes our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these, I encourage you to donate. That also makes you a member. So you can enjoy all of our wide variety of members only stuff too. So um, if you are interested in our usual weekly series of webinars at 1 p.m., they're usually on Mondays and Thursdays. However, this week, because of the 4th of July holiday, we're gonna skip Thursday and Monday. So next Thursday, we'll be bringing butterflies to your yard. So we'll be talking about different butterflies that you might see here in the Chicago suburbs, as well as plants and things that you can do to help attract them to your yard. Without further ado then, I'm gonna turn things over to Jim Kleinwachter, our esteemed conservation at home guru. Your camera was on, Jim. You wanna go ahead and turn that back on? I will yep, turn there it, it is. <clears throat> there you go, turn it back over to you now and take it away, Jim. Thank you, Jamie. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to run through a bunch of things. I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures. The idea is to stimulate your thought patterns uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions at the end. And then at the very end, there'll be some information uh, about how to contact me for additional help. Um, some of you that are in the area, like this is held tonight, um, sponsored by the Village of Downers Grove. If you're lucky enough to live in Downers Grove, they have a, a variety of things that are available for implementing conservation practices there. If you're outside of the area, we still help you regardless. So uh, when Jamie lets me switch over, I will start the presentation. And again, um, questions will be at the end. You should be good to go, Jim. All right. Okay. So our main office is in Naperville on the McDonald farm. 60 acres permanently protected with the conservation easement. 49 of it is being farmed in organic vegetables. We have butterfly gardens, solar panels, wind turbines, you name it. All these green infrastructure things that are available to see at the farm. You're welcome to come and visit. The farm dates back to the 1870s, but a lot of these green infrastructure pieces were added later. We have two different rainwater harvesting systems. So the old cistern that failed in your grandmother's house perhaps has been renewed with soft rubber liners that don't crack in the winter. And you can see a lot of these things all in one place. You can see right in this picture where the 
road would have gone right through the center of the farm had it not been for the protection of this property. Why I'm talking to people about, and some of you are not even in Illinois, but the majority of our areas are private property. So if you look at forest preserves, they own a small piece of it, but uh, a huge amount of the land is private property. So if you want our communities to be nice, we have to think about how to implement these conservation practices on our own with, um, and that's what I'm gonna show you in this uh, segment. So we all have had exterior um, experiences out in life. And I show the picture on the left. I always tell people that's my little sister, but um, it isn't that I'm a nature guy talking to you today. We all are nature people. And in this book by Stephen Keller, it, his topic here, his uh, quote is just a wonderful thing understanding that we are a part of nature and we can't deny that we're animals and um, guiding my son to his first big musky or hiking the Appalachian Trail um, we have to understand that nature is where we find happiness where we find peace and Jamie just explained in her thing um, in her beginning talk where did she go when she had vacation time she went up to the North Woods and I'm headed over to Michigan uh, over the 4th of July weekend to play in the lake. And um, whether you go to Florida or you go to Montana, wherever your vacations would go, when you have time and money, you get the heck out of Dodge and you take off for nature. Um, the only two places I can think of that people go to, maybe Las Vegas or New York City, the rest of them, there's some connection to nature to the beauty of the mountains or the ocean or the water that we're drawn to. So kind of understanding that a little bit, that we want these things in our lives and having a little bit of that that we can put back into our own yards because we can't get to Yellowstone very often. This is a quote by Lewis Bromfeld. And I think today with the day and age that we're seeing now and how the world is highly stressed over a variety of things that are happening. They're cutting the rainforest, the plastic in the ocean, wherever you're looking around, the negative impact of human beings is clearly evident. There's been a lot of things showing up during this COVID thing. Since people have been locked away, the animals are doing better. So it's not even the animals are thriving well, they're, they're doing better without us around them. So how do we have less impact and less negative things going on? How do we make it a more positive experience when we're outside is what I'm gonna be helping you about. So my daughter here is dancing in the Mediterranean at two in the morning, my son and his best friend. I think the people that are in garden clubs, you get the feeling that um, nature makes you happy. So that's what I'm trying to do. My background is in marketing and sales. And when I joined the Conservation Foundation and realized that as conservation people, we're not selling the value of nature very well and the value of water and the value of these birds and butterflies. So how do we do that better? So with this Conservation at Home program, I use it to promote sound environmental practices. So I'm selling nature, so to speak. Um, There's simple things that I'm gonna be talking about. Adding organic material to the soil, improving soil capacity, better wildlife attraction, sustainable things. So people that say I have a brown thumb, I can't grow anything. Well, I'm gonna tell you that using the things that are native to this area are gonna help you with that. They're very sustainable and long lived. And things like trees, shrubs, other things like that, that fit into the environment rather than stick out of the environment and that aren't connecting with the things that we have. I talked to a lot of people from diverse um, situations where they have come from um, all over the world and just explained to them that at this period of time, they've invested in a home in, in Illinois, for example. And since you're living in Illinois, why don't we think about the plants and the animals that are indigenous to this place. If you move to 
Arizona, at some point, you'll be learning about cactus. But right now, we're here in Illinois, and let's embrace the things here. This is a yard right in Glen Ellen, and they don't have any grass in the front yard. Now, this might be a little uh, wild for you, but these people love it. Their neighbors are all happy with it. And I'll show you some techniques and how we're doing some of these things. So even if you don't want to go to this extreme, there's elements that I think you can take. Some of the things that we found would be the clumping. This orange clump that you see there is actually a milkweed. And I'll tell you more about that. But beautiful plants can be arranged in a fashion that would be attractive and functional. The Conservation Home Program is spread around Northeastern Illinois. It's gonna be hard to see these dots, but they, a dot represents a home that has had implementation of conservation practices. They're scattered around. Uh, we've even got some into Michigan and Indiana, Wisconsin, and all the way down to St. Louis area. There are some um, people running our Conservation at Home Program. Even a newest addition would be one in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We have a program for non-residential sites, that is conservation at work. And these are just a short list. We have over 140 sites, um, corporate campuses, colleges, universities, uh, nature centers, hospitals, you name it. We can implement these same practices I'm gonna to show tonight on any kind of property, any size. This is right on the McDonald farm. And the idea is that these native plants are gonna help productivity of your yard in general. So in this picture on the left, you're looking at Monarda, which is bee balm, next to a pear tree. The Monarda is gonna be the attractant for all the insect life, the pollinators. And then when the pear tree needs to be pollinated, they'll be right adjacent to it and it'll get the job done. On the right picture, you're looking at swamp milkweed, these pink flowers by the bridge here. And that's going to attract pollinators that are going to pollinate the strawberries or the other plants. So using these plants, we don't have to think of our vegetable garden as being, you know, a rectangle where we grow our tomatoes. We can have flowers adjacent to it, an attractive yard that'll bring productivity and sustainability to the yard at the same time. We do the same thing on park districts. So in this particular picture, we worked on this creek area. The erosion that was a problem there has been taken care of. And as we get older and we're not uh, playing soccer all the time or our kids are not there, we're walking our dog or we're jogging, um, doing other things in the park. And to see that these natural areas have been improved. I saw a mink swim across this creek while I was on the bridge. And the habitat will determine what kind of wildlife we have and we get to see in these areas. This is an, an area in a park and it never was going to be a soccer field. The bottom of this swale, this ditch was just mud and the tractors would go down in it and try to mow the lawn and it never worked. The tractors got stuck and made ruts. And we're not gonna call it a ditch anymore. We're gonna call it a bioswale. So it's a living ditch that collects the water. You can see from the topography that water is going to collect in the bottom. It's not gonna sit there and have be a mosquito breeding ground. These roots of the plants are going to suck it up and it's going to be an area where a baby bunny or a toad could find refuge from the mower. You could see the mower tracks of this, the mowers that go around there. So grass is not a hospitable surface for any kind of wildlife and there's at least a little refuge in this park where that something can go in and hide. So simple things I'm going to talk about. Water conservation, um, using naturally occurring pesticides, for example, ways like this bird in the picture here is eating some of the bugs we might have problems with, creating quality habitat and nesting sites for birds and butterflies, less chemicals, less grass I'm going to talk about, and rebuilding healthy soils and better tree choices. So the first place where this starts, is like a book. We're gonna go through and chapter one would be that the sun is the energy factor for this whole planet. That there is no life on the planet 
if it was not for the sun. And plants are the only thing between the sun and us that can convert the sun's light by photosynthesis into food. So it feeds all the food chains. Any food chain you looked at, it would have plants on the bottom, followed by all the animals that can use it. We don't even think about the plants as creating atmosphere. They give off oxygen and they help transpire the water and bring the rain back up again. And it, um, the whole system creates atmosphere that made life possible on earth. So kind of understanding that plants are not just decorative things, they are essential for all life on the planet. That's the first step. The next step would say that it makes a difference what plants we choose. If I had a table full of plants and you were hungry, and I had some farola sod and some hosta and some daylilies and a bowl of broccoli, you'd know immediately what is food for you and you would go to the broccoli, of course. The same thing is happening with wildlife. So this hummingbird is scanning your property and deciding right then if there's anything there for me or not. If you don't have many hummingbirds, we probably haven't put out the things that they're looking for and attracted them with our landscape. There are pretty choices. This prairie drop seed is this gentle grass that I have here. It lives in a hot, dry climate, so it wouldn't matter. Um, this area between the parking lot and the sidewalk, very inhospitable. It's hot, it's dry, it's raised up from the parking area, and so it's not going to get a lot of water from the runoff of the parking area. But there still are things we can grow in these tough areas that are going to be better than putting turf grass and trying to mow it there. So here's the whole secret. It's in the root system. And on the far left, we'll talk about grass a little bit later, but understanding that these plants I'm talking about are just better um, they evolved in Illinois and are better suited for Illinois climate. So they're going deeper than an oak tree and they're feeding wildlife, they're absorbing water, they're cleaning water, they're creating oxygen, there's sequestering carbon, all these things that are happening and we really don't appreciate it because we can't see it. In the animal world, we understand a turtle with its shell or a giraffe with its long neck. We understand the evolutionary process, but we don't see it as much in plants. So if there was a plant in a pot, you'd just say, well, it's a plant. But plants are not created equal. They're not giving the same thing back. It's, um, the term is called environmental benefit whether a plant gives something back to the environment or whether it just is sitting there kind of, a lot of plants that we bring from other places sit in our landscape like a cement block or a plastic gnome. They just don't have an engagement into the environment. Look at the root systems here. So get an idea of the, how these plants have survived. So a plant in Illinois has to survive droughts and hail and snow and sleet and um, flooding and still be able to come back. They had buffalo trampling the top. They had fire that would burn the entire tops of the plants off. But you can see with such a sophisticated root system, the top part could be sacrificial. You could burn it off. You, we literally see that when we do these prairie fires that we purposely burn the top off. The, the weedy species, the ones that are not evolved, cannot survive the fire and the native plants of Illinois are accustomed to that fire regiment that went all the way back to the beginning of time. The Native Americans oftentimes would set the prairies on fire to renew them. And look at the, the bird species. This is one thing I can sell pretty easy, birds. Everybody likes certain birds. The top uh, right and the bottom left are actually invasive species, the European starling and sparrow. They don't even belong here. And I'll talk more about geese, how what we've done to our landscapes has caused a huge growth in the population of these four species. And really what you wanna see in your yard are these. Now these, this grouping here will come for a snack at your bird feeder. If you put out this old feed or sunflower seeds, um, the woodpeckers might be attracted to um, suet, 
or even the hummingbird has a feeder, we put out typically put out sugar water. Well, that's similar to me drinking a Pepsi. It's not sustainable for that hummingbird. They can get a sugar boost from it, but what they're looking for, all of these birds and the next grouping, are looking for insects. And most of them fly south in the winter. Following the insects, they'll come back again now and they'll be looking for bugs. The bugs are on the native plants. So there's an association between the plants and these birds. Many of these birds eat only bugs that wren on the bottom right. We put up a wren house, we want them to come, they sing so pretty, and yet we don't feed them. They never come to a bird feeder. The bluebird on the top right never comes to a bird feeder. Uh, kingbird, warblers, never. You, you might see the oriole come for grape jelly or fruit, but again, that is not their typical food. They're eating bugs. They will switch to berries in the summer. The, right in the center of the cedar waxwing with the yellow tip of the tail, he will switch to berries. If you have a viburnum or a service berry, you may see the cedar waxwing. Same thing with indigo bunting. They'll switch from berries or uh, bugs in the spring to berries in the summer to supplement their diet. But again, it's bugs is the main thing, a variety of different insects. And then um, besides that, other things, but they need the protein. Even a bald eagle will feed its babies grasshoppers. So the monarch is the poster child for all of nature. The environmental conditions that we have in our yards, this is the one that everybody pays attention to. So um, good or not, good or um, whether it's a good thing or not, this is what happens and people like butterflies. The other pollinators that are out there, uh, bees do the biggest majority of the pollinating, but nobody really wants to talk about bees or attract bees. They're afraid of bees or snakes or skunk in their yard. But understanding that the whole ecosystem is really what we're trying to attract. It's not just the monarch butterfly. On the right is a picture of some milkweed that was completely stripped by monarchs. They're out looking for a place to lay their eggs. And it was just interesting to see how they found these plants and really took advantage of them. Pretty simple, what we need for any type of um, things around our yard, any other type of critters. They need food, shelter, water. And in the case of monarchs, the females need milkweed to lay their eggs on. It's an interesting story how milkweed is a poisonous plant. Your dog won't eat it, rabbits won't eat it, deer won't eat it, but the monarch has this association with that plant and they must lay their eggs on that plant. The babies eat the poisonous milkweed and become poisonous themselves. And they, as they pupate into the monarch butterfly, the monarchs are themselves poisonous. So birds prefer not to eat an orange butterfly. And you can see how it's just a wonderful way to see how the whole ecosystem functions with that system. And the butterflies that we're seeing here, they're second generation most likely from their ancestors spent the winter in Mexico. They flew up into Texas, laid eggs, died, and the one from Texas has flown up into Illinois. They'll lay eggs here and continue on all the way up into Canada and back. So it's an amazing process and we can be part of it or not. This right in the center, you can see a monarch larva. This is downtown Lyle by the train station. And not a, where I'd consider you'd be a, um, where you'd see these plants. We created this rain garden to keep the water from going out into the parking lot here. And the monarchs found this, this is a swamp milkweed with the, the fine thin leaves. This is a picture of my granddaughter. So they live in Chicago in a very dense area of Chicago that does not have a lot of habitat. They're out walking. They found this milkweed. It does not look like it was planted there. 
somebody put a little uh, fence to kind of prop it up, but it's on the edge where it doesn't look like it was part of the planting. But on this plant, you can see right where she's pointing on the left picture is the monarch caterpillar. Even in downtown Chicago with all that's going on and the uh, high rise buildings and everything that monarch found its way down and found the milkweed. It's an amazing story and we can do this anywhere. Some of the milkweed is not that common milkweed that you saw in the last picture. This is the butterfly milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa. It's short, it's brilliant orange, only about knee high, very attractive for front sidewalk areas and easily implemented into your landscape and you could have monarchs um, on this plant. I wanna train your eyes a little bit to find landscapes that are not working. This site was in Naperville, right along the front of the city hall. And we got called to say, you know, can't we do something more environmentally friendly with this piece? So we did. And you can see we're trying to encourage people to get into the planting, to smell it, to hear it, to touch it, and, you know, feel what's going on in there, all the insect life and things that are happening in there it still is very pretty and quite an improvement over the previous one. So how would we do this on a residential landscape? So this is a house that uh, what they called us. They, their major problem was water. The downspout you see there sticking out, there's two of them on the front. The water would drain onto the sidewalk and water would sit there in the summertime and create problems for wet shoes. In the wintertime, it would turn to ice and be a hazard for um, walking across. They would have to put down tremendous amounts of salt to uh, melt the ice, and then the salt would then kill the grass adjacent to it. They have no birds, no butterflies, and how would you implement any kind of conservation practices on a site like this? Well, cut down the old arborvita that were blocking the charm of the brick house and it isn't rocket science to understand that water will go to a low spot. The grass over the years had gotten higher than the sidewalk so it ran off the grass pooled on the sidewalk. The sidewalk is impervious so it cannot drain down and it sat on the sidewalk. Now we're lowering down the landscape on the left side. We've created a path for the water to go away from the sidewalk. It's going to water water loving plants in that rain garden. We've taken out a lot of the grass and allow that water to percolate back in. On the right hand side you can see the defined edge where we kept some of the grass. It's a, it's a defined edge so it looks purposeful and it looks organized. The plantings are in clumps so that it looks like it was done on purpose and this is not a problem for city officials or um, neighbors or not going to complain about this type of change in landscape. So we have plants that grow on the top of the mountain and the bottom of the ocean. So whether it's hot or it's dry or it's shady or it's sunny, um, we have plants for those. There's even a cactus that grows in Illinois, for example. Um, and we're not going to use water. So a lot of you live in areas where we're using Lake Michigan water piped over to your community. Pay tremendous amounts of money for this beautiful clean water that is from Lake Michigan and then we're sprinkling it on the sidewalks and um, on plants in the front yard when it's drinking quality water. So the idea is plant plants that are pretty, that are hardy, that use rainwater to live off of. You don't need additional watering and besides that they're going to feed birds and butterflies. If you looked at what's in your yard now, you can Google whatever it is and find out where it's native, where it comes from. And this is just the top list that I came up with. You could put all kinds of other things on there. And the point that I'm trying to make is not that if you have any of these, get them out immediately. The idea is understanding that we wanna keep a functional part of the landscape. These are not gonna function well including the turf grass, which I'll talk about in a minute. But 
these are going to be in your yard and they're not going to provide the food value for the birds and butterflies. They're not going to absorb the trem tremendous amounts of water that we need them to absorb during our spring rains. And understanding that at least a portion of our landscape we want to be functional. In the house, we would not be able to function without um, the things that we need that are useful, like a microwave or the stove, the refrigerator, our bed, those things we use to make our life better. So we can have inside the house, we can have the um, plastic flowers on the table or a picture hanging on the wall that don't give us anything but aesthetic beauty. But if we lose the function of the microwave or these other things, it's not going to, our furnace, for example, we wouldn't have a good house. We would not deal with that. But in the yard, we're not thinking of it in the same way that we need to keep function and have a balance at least of some functional things to do the things that we want them to do. And then we can add some decorative things uh, around that. So I'm selling the concept of we can have the pretty and the functional. And a lot of people don't even know that which ones are functional and which ones are not. So that's part of the education that we bring to people is to understand which ones are which. And you don't have to sacrifice beauty for function. Milkweed on the bottom left here is the swamp milkweed that likes it wet. It can live in some light shaded areas. And within this grouping here, these are a lot of these will do well in wet areas. And the turtle head, cardinal flower, iris. Some of the plants like the blazing star on the right, there's a version of it that likes wet. There's a version that likes dry. There's a version that will take some shade. And the same thing with the milkweed. The orange one that I showed you earlier is a dry loving milkweed. And this one will do much better in wet and take some shade. So we put grass everywhere. And one of the reasons the grass is not functioning is because it's not from this area. And it's um, second thing that's happened is plants that are um, what this is called a monoculture of one species will attract uh, a monoculture of animals that can use that. Geese use grass. They're fat, they're lazy. They want to walk into the water and walk out. So this area is not particularly a good place to put a blanket down and have a picnic with your kids. You know it's going to be loaded with goose poop. There hasn't been, um, I see this property here, there's no dandelions and weeds, so I'm guessing it's been sprayed. You can see erosion on the shoreline of the lake. This lake is not a good place to even fish. The bass or any other predator fish that would be in here have no draw to come to the shoreline. And what we've done is created a good place for geese. They are deathly afraid of coyotes as their main um, predator. And they wanna be able to see the coyote long before it's near them. So changing the habitat would be one way of stopping this from happening. So we saw the grass in that root picture of how short the grass is. When we bring grass to the shoreline of a pond or a creek, we're asking for the, the root system to fail. So could I sell you on a different sustainable surface, the one that was here for thousands of years prior to the European settlers coming in, which would have been a naturalized shoreline. Now here you've got, instead of the geese, which they will not be here, you've got herons maybe walking in the water and they're eating frogs and the bass are coming up to eat the frogs or the crayfish along the shoreline. You don't have the erosion and you've got a diversity of flower species that are attracting birds and butterflies and praying mantis and snakes and whatnot. With those homeowners living in that subdivision like to look at this? Do I have to sell them on the concepts of um, better water quality, for example? Um, and the geese would be gone. So with grass, we've been doing the wrong thing with grass. I used to sell fertilizer. That's a bag of Scott's fertilizer on the right. And they say in their ads, feed it. They're selling you fertilizer 
And a lot of times what they're selling you is not even what you want. So that bag that you're seeing there might be a $50 bag of fertilizer. You bought primarily nitrogen. The first number, 32, here is nitrogen. And our grass is not starving for nitrogen. And the grass can't handle that much nitrogen, so it's washing off. And what nitrogen does to grass is make the blade grow quick. And that's really not what you want. You want healthy soils, you want healthy root structure, and that's not what you bought. You bought quick growing blade of grass. And in many cases, that's the exact opposite of what you want. The grass, when you think about it, is the photosynthesis device for the plant. So the grass grows up, it photosynthesizes, it can feed itself, it can grow and do all the things it needs to do, but we don't allow that grass to grow. If it grows up quick, we mow it quicker. So we cut the exact thing down that is sustainable on the plant. And um, we spend all this money trying to grow the grass. We're doing the wrong thing with the grass. When the nitrogen cannot be absorbed in the grass, it's going to run off and that's caused problems in our waterways. Grass is the biggest crop in 39 of the lower 48 states. So we fell in love with grass. It was said to be brought over first by Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, very costly surface. He didn't care, he had servants that would mow it and take care of it and, and so on. But from that simple beginning, we all want a little piece of that action. The only states that are not majorly lawn are mountainous states or states very poorly populated or like in Nevada and Utah, they're desert areas, which make it very difficult. Um, Arizona, a lot of that's desert and we still paved over it with grass. Look at the numbers on grass. $40 billion of grass, 20 million acres of an unproductive surface. It's considered biologically dead. It doesn't grow broccoli for the poor. It's not doing anything for us. Sure, sure we need it for Wrigley Field, places along the sidewalk, by the library, but do we need to cover 39 of the lower 48 states with this surface is the question. And if I showed you left or right, which one's prettier? Which one looks like it's brown during a drought? And yet the other side is in full bloom. There's that orange milkweed again and cone flowers. And the left side needs to be mowed periodically or weekly. And the right side doesn't need to be mowed at all. Maybe we burn it or mow it, cut it down once a year. If you're walking down here with anybody from your family, where is your eyes going to be attracted? And where would the geese be if they were in this picture? Certainly going to be on the left. So does it make a lot of sense to you? What we have done in society is cultivating this surface that isn't doing a whole lot for us. We're promoting the concept of a pollinator meadow, a shorter flowering surface that could replace turf in a lot of areas, college campuses. We're applying it to a variety of different areas. We put um, a stretch of it at the McDonald farm. So our stretch is 25 feet wide and 1400 lineal feet along a regional bike trail. So we don't have to mow this and it's feeding birds and butterflies, it's absorbing water and we burn it. We cut it maybe once a year instead of once a week and um, very happy with the area that we have out by the bike path. I sold it to the park districts and uh, in this case, this picture is the toll road authority. So the, the mowed part is called the front slope and I don't know. Really it's gone. So these deep rooted plants are sucking up the water. The orange, the uh, white plant that you see blooming here, that's Penstemon digitalis. It's the heart medicine. You've heard of digitalis, the heart medicine. They first derived it from that plant. Very attractive to hummingbirds. There's tubular flowers that the hummingbirds will feed off of. I saw them feeding on this plant at the McDonald farm just yesterday. So this Property here is 50% less costly for the toll road to maintain than grass would be. So you can see the direct correlation between 
if it costs the toll road less, then they don't have those fees to have to pay with our tolls. So it's a win-win situation, birds and butterflies, toads and frogs, um, less costly. So why are we doing some of these things that we've been doing? On the other projects we're working at park districts, we try to create situations where people can get into the prairie and um, have paths and put out benches and educational signs at the beginning so they can learn a little bit while they're walking their dog and come in contact with other people, um, as well as the birds and different things they might see while they're out on their nature walk. We've been doing, we're getting out of the water section. Um, we pave over things. So it's called impervious surfaces. We've covered a lot of areas. Every time we build a new highway or put up a Walmart, we make the ground impervious to water percolation. When we don't go down in the ground with it, then it has no other place to go but run off. And in this depiction, you're looking at how it used to be where rain would fall and be absorbed and slowly work its way into our rivers and streams. Now it's with that area being built up, it's directly pouring into the stream very quickly, causing flooding, and it carries a lot of material with it. So the exact term it's called is non-point source pollution. It used to be that the biggest pollution came from pipes from factories. The factories would be dumping things in the river. That's all been pretty much stopped. And now the number one source is coming from these non-point source pollution. It's not coming from a pipe. It's coming from runoff on the ground. And that's the name we're using is runoff is the easy term to talk about because it's hard to say non-point source pollution. But the grass does not hold much water. And whether it's trees you're trying to, in this picture you see the tree to the right, that tree is not getting a lot of this water. So the water's here and available, but not to that tree. It's gonna race past the tree and pour into the storm drain. The problem is it's carrying a lot of that nitrogen with it. So whether it be a farm field or a grass area, Carrying that nitrogen into the river systems, all of our water, all of it from uh, Wisconsin all the way down to the whole entire state is suffering from eutrophication. It's called excess nutrient load in the water. Some of this comes from, in the fall, comes from leaves. We rake the leaves out by the curb or you see leaves that have um, ended up in the road. The, as the leaves start to decay, they release their phosphorus and nitrogen in the leaf parts or grass clippings or just the straight nitrogen that's running into the street into the storm drains causing these problems with the water quality. You see the grass or the, um, in this picture you're seeing algae bloom. I just read an article about a big algae bloom that's happening in Herrick Lake in Wheaton and other places are having these algae bloom and one of the ways to solve this problem is let the plants clean the water. So the term is called phytoremediation, where plants can actually clean air, water, and land. They use them on brown fields in Chicago to clean up the soil. They're being used, Amico is, or BP is using prairie drop seed that I showed you earlier to um, dissipate gasoline in the soil. So that prairie plant can eat gasoline. It breaks up the carbon atoms in gas and oil and can metabolize that and um, turn it back into inert. So what gasoline we think of as a pollutant and it can resolve that issue. So in this picture in the backyard situation, the house is up high, we slope the land away from the house and little Johnny wants to have a place to play soccer or baseball. So we have this yard and I don't see one weed in the yard. So let's say that they're having it sprayed with some chemical to keep it perfectly manicured. But in this picture, they've created a buffer on the outside that is going to catch that rainwater and all those nitrogen load that's coming with it and filter that water so that it doesn't have a negative impact on the creeks and rivers that we're adjacent to. 
in your yards, um, you know, when we were talking about Downers Grove, they have a lot of areas that are ditches in the front. So the yards drain out towards the road. There's a big swale or a ditch along the road that carries that water away. Or in many cases in the backyard, you might have a drain head like this one depicted here. The roads are up high and the water is sloped in this basin into this drain head. In this picture, what we're trying to do is keep the water out of that drain as long as we can. So we're gonna plant plants on the up, uphill side of these drain heads. We're gonna filter it with all that root system. We're gonna water our plants automatically in this rain garden, and we're gonna keep it out of that pipe. So you might not live anywhere near the, the pond in your neighborhood or the river, but we have to understand that we are connected and the other side of that pipe is where the ugly part comes in. So most of our area that we're in here in Illinois, we're connected to the Illinois um, Fox River, Illinois River, Mississippi waterway system. And all of our water is draining down the Mississippi and ends up dumping into the Gulf of Mexico at New Orleans. And this is just a small picture of the kind of runoff that is coming out of the mouth at New Orleans that's caused a dead zone the size of New Jersey. So understanding that we all are connected to this and we all have a little part in making some small changes that might make things better. One of the rain gardens we built at the McDonald farm, you can see the downspout in the center in the back and we have a rubber sheet that's laid down there. It's gonna have an elbow on that downspout. The rubber mat keeps it from going back into the basement. It's sloped towards this area we've shoveled out in the center. There's rocks behind me to the right that are gonna go over that rubber mat. The water coming shooting out of the downspout is gonna bounce off these rocks and filter slowly into this garden on the bottom. And we're gonna let the plants do their thing. Notice on the left, we have the air conditioning unit that's sitting out there kind of ugly. We didn't want to mow this section, and so it is now a rain garden. The lower part has different plants. That white is the penstemon that I talked about earlier. The purple is spiderwort. And along the edge and the dry area along the sidewalk, those clumping grasses are the prairie drop seed that I also talked about, the one that will eat gasoline. Notice the air conditioner is now hidden in viburnum bushes which provide a lot of berries that the birds can eat in the summertime. And uh, it blooms white and pink blooms in the spring. So there's different ways to deal with the water. One of the ways would be catching it in a rain barrel. We sell rain barrels. We're up to 14,000 rain barrels we've sold across the region. If you're not gonna catch it in a barrel and use it for um, watering your plants or giving to your pets, we try to educate people that rainwater is better. It's better for washing your car. Grandma used to wash her hair with it. Um, and these swales that were along the roadways, these pictures to the bottom and the, to the right, are swale gardens or bioswales that are catching that water and preventing it from draining down and dumping in the river so quickly. So that's what I'm trying to do with the Conservation at Home program is bring these concepts to people in an easy way that they can understand and um, understand that water will take the shortest path and go downhill. Really nothing complicated there. And I will take your questions, um, make it sound easy, but um, the good thing to know is that I did a presentation for a huge group um, not too long ago. And they had all these questions at the end and there was no time left. We had to get out of the room. And I said, I'm gonna answer all of your questions with one answer, yes. The idea is we have the internet, we have email, we have um, experts that can answer these questions. There are answers for every question that you have. All we have to do now is use, make use of it and have the need or the want to get the answers. Jamie. Sir, are you ready for questions? I am. All right. So we've had a couple of questions. Um, I've been answering some of the easy ones that I can. 
Um, but Julie would like to know, how do you deal with burning natural areas in your yard? Okay. Well, most areas you are allowed to burn. You'd have to check with your municipality about their rules and regulations and the EPA has a permit. So if you really wanted to do it, you can get a permit. We get a permit at the McDonald farm and you notify your fire department that when you're gonna be burning, when the wind is blowing in the right direction. So that would be the process. The other option would be a lot of contractors. We work with a variety of contractors that will come in, they're bonded and licensed, and they can take care of all the permitting situations and they will burn it for you, especially homeowners associations, park district areas, areas adjacent to homes or sensitive areas would certainly be burned by a licensed contractor. Okay, uh, John would like to know, what plants do you recommend on areas above septic tanks without damaging them? Wouldn't grass be ideal because then the roots wouldn't do any damage? I didn't catch the first part of that. Uh, plants <clears throat> to plant above septic tanks. Uh, um, grass, from there's different arguments about that, but I have not seen anything defining that says that you cannot plant uh, a prairie planting over a septic area. It's not like tree roots that would block the piping. The roots are very thin and they actually absorb water. So any excess liquid that might uh, pool on top of the septic thing, causing it to penetrate into the septic area and causing problems could be averted by these other natural areas near it. But you, you can do more homework on that topic uh, when you Google online. There's a variety of different things that come up. Some say yes, some say no. I personally haven't had any problem with it. Okay, and a follow-up on the burn question. Do you need to burn a smaller area? Good question. It does not have to burn. So if you're averse to burning or you can't get the permitting or don't wanna go through the process, the I mean, in a, in a prairie situation, and we're trying to get people to think how it works in nature. In nature, if the burn doesn't happen, there isn't any spark of fire or lightning, then the plants will survive. The old last year's plant will still be there and the new one comes right up around it. If, if it's in a front yard situation, you just cut it down. We typically tell people to cut it down in the spring so the plant material is up in the winter time and birds and insect life can live in the stems. And then in the spring when things are all dry and the seeds are gone and eaten by the birds, you can cut down last year's material, compost it in your composting bin and the new material will come up fresh. Yeah, I always consider mowing and burning to kind of do similar things like burning is the first line of defense if you can do it, just trying to keep the weeds down. And then if you can't burn, then mowing is kind of your next best option there. Uh, Mary says, I live by the drainage ditch for the neighborhood. What should I do? House on all grass with two trees only on my land ditches the city. You can contact your city. Most of the time that ditch in the front is um, parkway property. In the case of Downers Grove that I'm working with on this program tonight, they encourage ditch plantings and they actually can, uh, you can um, submit to the city to get funding to actually plant in that ditch. There are water loving plants. I can give you a whole list of things that we would put in there. Beautiful plants like that red lobelia that I showed earlier. Um, and it just absorbs the water. Um, in my mother's yard, her ditch is so steep that you couldn't even mow it. So we solved that problem by planting the bottom of the ditch with um, these native plantings, and then you just mow the edges that aren't so severe of a drop. Okay, um, April and Marianne are both asking um, for a little more information about rain barrels. April says, would like a rain barrel, but never had one. What happens if it overfills and does it freeze in the winter? Good questions. Uh, we've solved all the problems with that. Our barrels are repurposed barrels. So ours come from all over the world. That red one that you saw in the picture was uh, an actual olive barrel that came from Greece. We get 
olive oil, jardinier, pepperoncini, jalapenos, a lot of different food products come in those barrels and then we convert them to rain barrels. There are overflows built into them and we also, we also sell a diverter which would send water to the rain barrel until the barrel's full and then water would go down the downspout similar to what it does now. So there's a variety of different ways to deal with overflow. Our barrels are about 60 gallons. There's a variety of ones you can buy online, different styles and different colors and so on. Um, but they all are built in with some type of overflow protection. Okay, um, let's see. What's the best way to start incorporating these native flowering ar around a large property slash pond? Plant start, seed planting, bombing? It depends on the size. Um, the yards I went to today, they were looking at areas along the front sidewalk. There, you'd certainly wanna put plants in. It's gonna be much faster and you get a more unified look. A lot of those pictures I showed you the organized looks that had clumps of plants were done with plantings. Um, and you take the information uh, of what plants you want, you go to your nursery, you tell them exactly what species that you're looking for, and you buy three of them or five of them like you do with other landscaping and you clump these plants to a more organized look. If it's in the backyard where it's, you want it more like a prairie look, then you can seed, seeding takes two to three years really for it to start to bloom. So where possible, I tell people to get the plugs or small plants and let them grow up. Okay. Um, the 1400 foot strip you mentioned that was converted to no native plants. How do you start a strip like that? Seed over grass for a few years or question mark? And this, depending on the size of it, um, you can cover it with a tarp or cardboard. In this case, ours being 25 feet wide and 1,400 lineal feet, we couldn't cover it. You should not plant in traditional turf grass. The, um, our turf grass is a cool season grass and it would not do well with warm season um, other native plants. So the grass has to be gone. Uh, we herbicided the grass that was there and we planted right in the dead grass area. So on large spots like college campuses or on our site where there are acres and acres of ground herbiciding. We have an organic farm. We use one herbicide that's used as vinegar. It's a high acidic uh, material. And so it kills a variety of different things using vinegar, which is less of a problem chemical. Yeah, the important thing is you just can't plant, you can't throw the seed into the grass and think it's gonna take over because the grass right. will kind of keep it out. Um, any recommendations for a large yard that has a few places where water collects? We have some buffer areas around the perimeter, but are trying to figure out how to address the puddles scattered in the middle. If the, you know, if they, if it clearly drains to those middle puddle areas, I would think about putting the rain garden right there. That way you don't have to change the topography. You don't have to do anything differently. If you look at um, where the water's coming from, so maybe it's coming off your driveway and it's running across the driveway and then ends up in that spot. You could address this maybe with a, a planting area next to the driveway so it never gets to where that puddle area is in the yard. So observing where this water is moving and try to address it as soon as you can. If it's coming from a downspout, then address it right there with a the rain garden. If you're in our area, we also, um, I can tell everybody that we will come out to visit you. If you're in Kane, Kendall, Will, DuPage counties, if you're in some of the other outer counties like Lake McHenry, um, all the way out to Rockford, those areas, we have other sister organizations that can help you and come out to the property and help you assess what's going on there. If not, you're welcome to email me down below. It, now I'm not in the office as much, I'm out in the field, but email is a good way to catch me, ask me specific questions, or show me a picture of something if, it's in, if you're not in an area that we can come and help you directly. 
Gloria wants to know if you planted plugs into the turf grass, clearing a small area for each plug, would the natives eventually take over the turf grass? Would some native plants be more likely to do this than others? I would not do that. Um, I don't think the grass um, is not a good a place for the seeds to spread. So I don't think that the natives would overcome the grass unless you burned it. That would be another alternative, is, um, but grass does not burn very well. So it would take a tremendous amount of heat to kill the grass. So I would not recommend that. I would either, if you don't wanna kill the grass, you might be able to dig it up and put the grass clumps in a compost bin and then start with a bare area when you put your plants in. Janelle asked, do you have a list of places that sell native plants in other states? I'm in Wisconsin and would need to know which vendors have some of these plants. There are places like in Wisconsin, Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery oh, Prairie Moon. that you can get them online and they'll mail them out. Otherwise, it, you can go on our website or other websites. If you looked at Plants of Wisconsin, for example, you Google Plants of Wisconsin, it will give you lists, the botanic names of them. And just, you can take your list to your local independent garden center and say, I want Asclepias tuberosa. Can you get it for me? So a lot of the garden centers I work with, they say people don't come and ask for that stuff. So we don't have it. And we have to encourage people to go in and tell them this is what I want. And I think another important part there too, is when you do go into that garden center, ask them if they're spraying their plants. I try to discourage people from buying plants at big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot because you go there and they say they're selling natives and maybe they are, but they've almost always been treated with some kind of insecticide. So you're bringing these plants out to encourage these pollinators to come in and then poisoning their food. So talk to your independent garden center, ask them what they put on their plants, make sure they're not spraying them with insecticides and things like that. Okay, a um, couple of, this is, these are some great questions to wrap up with here. Uh, Dana wants to know how to become a part of this. I think it sounds like she wants to become a part of the Conservation at Home program. Um, and Anonymous also wants to get a plaque as well. Great, on our website, there's information, there's a checklist of things and or you, Send me an email and tell me where you live and what problems you're um, finding. You certainly can do it online. We'd love to have you become members and part of the program. So one of the two ways, either go online and sign up or contact me directly. Okay. And uh, Dana also wants to know, um, looking for information on, on submitting to the city for funding to do the ditch area, like planting- If you're in Downers Grove, then that's where they have the funding. You can also get um, in Downers Grove, again, you can get $25 for putting in a rain barrel. And I wanna think you can get $100 for doing a rain garden and some additional money for doing the ditch garden and you would contact the city of Downers Grove, the lady there, her name is Carrie Bear, I believe. But you can also find me and I can help you get those links if you wanted to. Most communities don't have a payment program for installing this stuff, it's up to you. But it doesn't have to be that costly, you can do this low, low cost. All right. That looks like all the questions that we have. So perfect timing here. looks like we'll wrap up just after eight o'clock. So uh, thank you, Jim, for doing this. Uh, Christine wants to know if there's a list of incentives for rain barrels. I don't think, I don't know that we have a list of every city that does them. Um, but if you send us an email with where you are, we can let you know if we're aware of anything that's in your area. All right. So thank you so much, Jim. And thank you all for attending. We hope to see you back again at our usual Thursday afternoon webinar uh, next, not this coming Thursday, but next Thursday after the 4th of July holiday, where we will be talking about butterflies again. So with that, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you joining thank us. You.
giving us part of your evening. So thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>